This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. How's it going everybody? So continuing from my last video, another thing that I've been seeing in the comments a lot is people responding to my several videos talking about the interesting directions that life has taken during the Triassic period. And these comments can be divided into two camps. The Triassic animals aren't weird, they're just different than what we're used to camp. And the holy crap, what is that thing in the thumbnail? It looks like the Jack Officer from that one old episode of South Park camp. And to the first group, my response is yes, you're absolutely right. I agree totally. In fact, I agree so much that I actually said that in the video you're commenting on. So moving on. As far as this thing goes, the reason why I didn't mention it in a list video or something was because I felt like it needed its own Paleo Catalog Basics video. And since everyone's so interested in the Jar Jar Binksosaurus, I figured that now would be a good time to talk about it. Because it really is very interesting. Especially because as we learned about this creature, we learned that it evolved to fill a very different niche than its relatives. And our understanding of this thing has changed a lot over the years since the first specimen was found. Including the main thing that grabs everyone's attention about it. That face. So let's get into the basics on Atabodentatus. Despite this being a pretty recent discovery, the process of figuring this animal out was kind of a long story. It was first identified in 2014 from a single skeleton found in Luping, China. This three meter long reptile was only one of several animals found in what we came to realize was a marine deposit. It was an impressive layer of fossils, dated to around 244 million years ago, a time that many scientists find very fascinating. That's because the animals from this time give us the opportunity to see what life was like when first recovering from the biggest mass extinction in Earth's history. Now, we've talked about the Great Dying before, and we discussed how the unique animals of the Triassic show us how adaptive radiation was life's way of bouncing back from events like this. And for the most part, this guy looked pretty normal by Triassic standards. Kind of like a three meter long marine iguana. But there was one thing that stood out about it. It's face. Even comparing with Tanny Strophius as your neighbor, this is rough. It's got jowls on the sides of its face that fold into a vertical mouth full of tiny teeth that interlock like a zipper. Scientists could only guess at what advantages this bizarre face hole gave. And they eventually settled on the theory that it uses its mouth to filter feed on the ocean floor and sift small arthropods out of the sediment. Because of several other bones throughout its body, they concluded that this was a basal branch of the Sauropterygians, a group of reptiles that took to the seas during this time and eventually would become the Plesiosaurs and Pliosaurs, who would be the dominant marine reptiles throughout much of the Mesozoic. There were a couple different early species from this order that we knew existed around this time, but this is the only one to adapt such a strange mouth. Most of the others were actively predatory macro carnivores, meaning they hunted larger prey like fish. But it was clear that Adipotentatus was doing something different. And even though for a while this theory was generally accepted, something just didn't seem right. So of course, such an outstanding fossil site was going to warrant further study. And there was a lot of really amazing stuff found over the few years that followed. A mix of several different arthropods, fish, and even other marine reptiles like early ichthyosaurs. Even a coelacanth fossil that was so well preserved that you could see that it was carrying eggs at the time when it died. These are the kind of places that paleontologists dream of finding because it gives us the opportunity to paint a more complete picture of what an ecosystem was like at a particular time. And it'll hopefully yield fossils that will help us better understand creatures like this. Because even when you have a fairly complete skeleton, it's very hard to learn everything when there's just one. Any little quirks in the way that a specimen is fossilized can skew our understanding and lead to us getting the wrong idea about it. And that turned out to be the case with Adipodentatus' face. Because in 2016, two more skeletons were found. And the difference here was that these two specimens were flattened out vertically instead of horizontally. And from this position, it was clear that scientists had made a mistake. Instead of having a face that looked like it has a zipper mouth, it was instead basically a hammerhead lizard. Because of the way the original specimen was compressed, the skull was essentially crushed in a way that folded down the sides of its mouth. And because there was no other specimens to compare it to, 
it was next to impossible to tell that this wasn't its natural shape. But with this discovery, we obviously had to go back to the drawing board. It was going to take some study, along with some arts and crafts, to figure this one out. Its mouth formed kind of a scraper with needle-like teeth that led scientists to conclude that this animal was probably more likely a herbivore than a bottom-feeding carnivore probably feeding on aquatic plants. This led to many more questions about how this animal lived its life, because until now, we thought all the members of Sauropterygia were carnivores. And going from a meat-eater to a plant-eater can be a very difficult process. When we find the remains of a bizarre creature like Adipodentatus, it raises all kinds of questions about how it fit into its world. Fortunately, in a place like Lu Ping, the fossil record is complete enough to get a really good idea of what the ecosystem was like. The whole region was a warm, shallow sea that was slowly expanding into the Tethys and Paleotethys Ocean. Pangaea as a whole had a lot of shallow seaways all around the massive supercontinent. And since marine life was just as affected as terrestrial life by the Permian extinction, there was just as much of a power vacuum as new animals evolved to fill different niches. In particular, we see a large assortment of reptiles starting down the path of being aquatic hunters. Animals like Utantosaurus, which is one of the earliest known ichthyosaurs, and Pistosaurus, another relative of Adipodentatus that was clearly better designed for eating meat and eventually would give rise to the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. And then there are animals like the Phytosaurs, which are some of the most interesting Triassic animals. Because despite their appearance, this is not a crocodile. This was a separate family of reptiles altogether that would live a very similar life to crocodiles in the Triassic, while the basal archosaur ancestors of both crocodiles and dinosaurs were just starting out. The point is, there was a lot of animals taking advantage of the shallow sea environment. And these animals all show up within just a few million years of the Permian mass extinction. This suggests that there was a lot of animals quickly adapting to this ecosystem. So with so much competition, it may have been beneficial for some animals to go in a different direction. Like growing a shovel face and becoming better equipped for scraping plants off of rocks underwater. This makes Adipodentatus the oldest plant eating marine reptile that we know of. And since all of its relatives that it lived alongside were carnivores, it's safe to assume that it probably descended from a carnivorous ancestor. You know, whether it's from competition ramping up during the Triassic period, or just being able to financially survive buying food at the grocery store in 2022, getting enough good food to eat can be a really stressful challenge. And if you hate stressful meal planning, then you'll love today's sponsor, HelloFresh. What are you doing? Quiet. Here, have a buffalo chicken ranch wrap. Ooh, buffalo chicken ranch wrap. If you're like me, figuring out what to eat and buying it at the grocery store week after week has always been a painful experience. And the way prices have been going up for everything nowadays has made it even worse. But HelloFresh allows me to skip the grocery store altogether. The HelloFresh market is a one-stop shop for all of your mealtime needs with quick breakfast, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. I've been considering trying some meals out for a while and finally decided to give it a try. I really enjoyed some of their chicken options like the Mexican chicken and rice bowls as well as the buffalo chicken ranch wrap that I just mentioned. And they make it easy to prepare and eat without sacrificing flavor. So you can maintain any fitness and health goals and feel good about your food choices. And the foolproof step-by-step -step recipes are ready in around 30 minutes or less. And best of all, HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant or going to the grocery store, which very well could be the secret to survival in these uncertain times. If you thought about giving this a try and are somehow not convinced, I have a special offer for Paleoanalysis viewers today. Just go to HelloFresh.com and use the code PALEOANALYSIS16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. If you want to cut down on grocery store bills, food waste, and the stress of buying and cooking complicated meals, HelloFresh would be perfect for you. Okay, wow, yeah, this is actually really good. Screw it, I'm on board. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code PALEOANALYSIS16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. So even with all the opportunities that the shallow sea presented, the competition from its relatives and other reptiles was probably the reason why Adipodentatus evolved into the bizarre form that you see. It went into a direction that would allow it to take advantage of food sources that weren't being utilized by its competitors. We see similar situations in other parts of the animal kingdom as well, where a single member of an otherwise carnivorous group goes in a totally different direction and becomes a devout herbivore. The first example in the modern world that I can think of is with the giant panda. Now I know that as a whole, bears are generally pretty versatile. 
many species like brown and black bears are actually omnivorous and can vary how much plants versus meat they consume based on the habitat that the individual lives in or even what time of year it is. But regardless, bears as a family have evolved from a carnivorous ancestor. However, because of competition from dogs, cats, hyenas, and other carnivores, one group of bears in East Asia went in a completely different direction and started taking advantage of different food sources that it didn't have to compete for. But when you look at the skull and teeth of a panda, it obviously still retains traits that show its carnivorous heritage. Although much more modest when compared to a polar bear, which is the most devout carnivore among living bears, there can be a lot of benefits to a single species of primarily carnivorous animals changing to herbivory, but it normally takes very special adaptations to get there. And like we've talked about before, being a specialist works great, as long as things stay the same. However, as soon as things change, you may find yourself at the end of the line. And unfortunately for Adipodentatus, the end of the Triassic was going to bring a lot of change. One of the main factors that led to the end of the Triassic had to do with the supercontinent Pangaea starting to drift apart. The land started to split along the fault lines, and volcanism started to push some areas above the surface that were previously submerged beneath the waves. Some marine reptiles, like the early ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and pliosaurs, were able to easily adapt to hunting in deeper waters, but what we don't see beyond the Triassic is any fossils from these bizarre herbivorous sauropterygians or the long-necked tanistrophids. In the case of Tanistrophius, it was probably because they were outcompeted by the more mobile and effective long-necked plesiosaurs. But for Adipodontatus, they were probably so specialized that they likely only ate a few different types of plants. I imagine they lived a very similar life to a marine iguana, basking near the coast and diving into the shallow Tethys Sea to feed on algae or some other soft plant with their shovel-like bills and tiny scraping teeth. They adapted to this way of life because they were taking advantage of a food source that was being ignored by their competitors. But they had become so specialized to one type of food that when the world started to change and that food started to vanish, they struggled to react to a changing world. It was probably far easier for the marine reptiles that fed on fish to switch from hunting in shallow water to hunting in the open ocean. Becoming a specialist has its advantages, because that normally puts you in a spot where you cannot be outcompeted by others as long as you remain in your preferred habitat. But when that habitat starts to disappear, the more adaptive generalists are the ones who inherit the world. With only three specimens, there's a lot that we still don't know about Adipodentatus. I know a lot of you really wanted me to cover this in a previous Triassic video, but I really felt like it needed its own dedicated spotlight. So that's the Paleo Catalog basics on the Jackophosaur. I really enjoy thinking about unique animals like this and pondering how they could have behaved when they were alive. They are basically like a window to a forgotten world. I want to thank HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. And I want to thank all of you for joining me as I explore our planet's past. If you enjoyed this deep dive into this animal, don't forget to leave a like. And if you're new here, I would love it if you subscribed for more. Have a good one, everybody.